So I'm so excited to be here for the first ever Oregon Cannabis Association Tote Talks. So we're excited to see you guys. The idea behind this event, my name's Amy Margolis and I work with the Oregon Cannabis Association and I'm an attorney. And the idea behind this event was really to bring together as many people as we could to talk about what they're doing in the cannabis industry, what excites them, what's new, what's interesting, and to share that with you. And the idea was to take the TEDx model, which are rapid fire conversations about really fascinating, groundbreaking, disruptive ideas, and to turn it into something that the cannabis industry can use. And so we have brought together tons of people. They're each going to talk to you for 10 minutes about what really ignites their passion in this industry. And they really are some of the most exciting people you could listen to all in one place. And I want to make sure, before I forget, that we thank our sponsors. None of these events can take place without two things. One, your membership in the Oregon Cannabis Association, and two, sponsors stepping forward um, and bringing these things to everybody in the audience. So we want to thank MRX Labs, Ecofirma Farms, Sweet Relief, the Portland Mercury, Oregon's Finest, and Oregon. So let's give them a round of applause. tonight. At least I'm going to try and make things move fast tonight. Um, ten minutes each speaker, and they're going to tell you the very best things they can. I have first the honor of introducing Congressman Blumenauer. Everybody give Congressman Blumenauer a round of applause. I always have to think of something amazing to say. And I think in this case, since we're supposed to be short and sweet, I will just say that Congressman Blumenauer is the best champion this industry, this movement could have. And we are so proud to have him here. And we are so excited to hear what he has to say. I'm always proud to even share the stage for just a minute with Congressman Blumenauer. Welcome. Thanks for being here this evening. Uh, it is an honor to help kick off this Tote Talks. I hope you all have a copy of your program. Put it in your scrapbook. This is a phenomenal lineup with some people that I've had a chance, to, in some cases, to meet here over the last couple of years, being part of driving this industry forward. For me, the theme of the evening is, now is the time. I think it's fair to say that I've been involved with this crusade to reform America and marijuana laws probably longer than any other politician in America. But I could not be more excited about where we are right now, this minute. Now, there is a little bit of uncertainty. Uh, there are some forces we still have to battle. Jeff Sessions is not our friend. <laughs> and Donald Trump is a great big question mark, which is the kindest say thing I can say about Donald Trump. But at this point, as a practical matter, there is no turning back. Marijuana got more votes in the nine states that we had on the ballot last year than Donald Trump. <laughs> And in case people hadn't noticed, we won eight of those nine elections last fall. I'm only sorry I didn't spend more time campaigning in Arizona. Maybe we could have made it nine to nine. But we will get it next time. Who would have thought five or six years ago that we'd be at this space? That we would have, for instance, a bipartisan cannabis caucus in Congress. And, <laughs> One of my Republican co-chairs is an 83-year-old Republican from Alaska. You know, I, as I was campaigning around the country, I have made the observation that I believe, through the very core of my being, that this 
cannabis craft crusade will essentially be over in five years. I still think that's the case if we all do our part. And that operative phrase is if we all do our part. Why am I optimistic? Well, first of all, we're watching the convergence of so many powerful trends and political issues. The public is behind us as never before. Over 60% of the American public feels that cannabis should be legalized. The February polling numbers from the Quinnipiac University shows that medical marijuana is supported by 90% of Americans. And if you frame the question a little differently, regardless of how people feel about marijuana, do they think the federal government should mess with what the states are doing on their own? And overwhelmingly, they reject the notion, whether they believe in legalization or not, that the federal government should dictate what people in Oregon or California or Maine want to do with their cannabis policy. We're uniting two of the most powerful trends right now in American civic life, Black Lives Matter and criminal justice reform. The weight of our failed policy of marijuana prohibition has fallen on the shoulders of young men of color, especially African Americans. The discrimination and unequal application of the law and its devastating effects on young men of color are clear for everybody to see. There have been amazing, enormous, tragic costs, ruined lives, wasted future, to say nothing about creating more crime and wasting billions of dollars. All of this is a futile effort to stop people from using something they want and they know is less harmful than illegal activity. Activities. I mean, if we were rescheduling under the Controlled Substance Act now, starting from scratch, guided by science, cannabis wouldn't even be scheduled at all, and tobacco would be a Schedule One controlled substance. Here in Portland, we're sort of the national capital of alternative approaches to medicine. There's growing resistance to the over-medication and anger at the pharmaceutical industry, not just price gouging and addictive marketing. Medical marijuana, we know, is more effective, more benign, and cheaper. People know this. That's why they support medical marijuana, and most important, they use it. Ending the foolish prohibition on the cultivation of hemp is around the corner. I mean, think about it. Hemp was grown in a sustainable fashion, albeit by slaves, by George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. It was a sustainable, extraordinarily valuable product. They must be spinning in their grave at the prospect that it's illegal for American farmers and ranchers to grow. You can go down to Saturday Market and buy all sorts of perfectly legal hemp products. It just has to be imported into the United States. Well. We're going to stop that. Yeah. And part of this is just the intrusion of big government. People are fed up with the notion that the federal government should interfere with the wishes of people and things that they really have no business. The war on drugs was, has been political, ideological, directed towards those people, and used for political purposes. The Nixon tapes are chilling in their clarity. Well, this is, this too, is being reversed in something that I could not be more pleased with. It's an era of action. Personal freedom still matters, and that's why we're winning these elections all around the country. There's also some people who care about economic development. It should be a high priority, so to speak, particularly in ways that are sustainable. Cannabis is already a multi-billion dollar industry, and once we take off the shackles for what cannabis and hemp activities can do, we will have tens of billions of dollars to create not just new products, but cannabis tourism, research, more medical applications, the positive effect of ending the war on drugs 
and its ancillary expenses for enforcement and incarceration cascade. And we can dial that back and actually help people who have problems with being addicted to substance stop funding criminal enterprises and help people with serious addiction recover. We're financing both sides of the war on drugs. We've spent a trillion dollars in a futile effort at suppressing the legal, the uh, use of cannabis and the other activities that have been involved with the war on drugs have been an abject failure. We have more drugs on the street and cheaper than when we started. It's time to reassess what's going on. It's time to destabilize some of the criminal enterprises that are fueled on marijuana resources. The corruption that occurs in other governments, in law enforcement, and in fact, we are turning, in many cases, young people who are incarcerated on low-level drug charges are sentenced to some correctional facilities here and abroad that are basically community colleges for crime. They learn more about it, and they have the stigma of that arrest and conviction that makes it harder for them to do anything when they come out, but get back into the so we want to stop the marijuana battle. We want to scale down the mindless, ineffective enforcement, scale up treatment and education for anybody who needs it. And this approach that we have now demonstrably could not be less effective. You are helping bring about a revolution in terms of how we're going to end this drug war. We're, we are positioned to end another chapter in the war against science. There are marches this weekend and all over the country against the war on science. But one of the most, one of the most egregious chapters in the war against science is the war against marijuana science. Why shouldn't cannabis be freely fairly, extensively researched. We should have product development, understanding the opportunities for medical applications, and indeed the risks and the problems. Research is the answer, and the federal government needs to get out of the way. It's about to happen, I think, because one of the, what should be one of the easiest pieces of our marijuana reform package is bipartisan legislation we have that would be break the federal bottleneck on research. Now there are two other little things that we want to do in short order in this Congress. They're relatively non-controversial. Banking and fair taxes. But as a practical matter, even though the federal government has been stymied on it. The fact is, you know, those really are not controversial. I have worked on this issue from coast to coast for years. I have talked to tens of, th well, tens of thousands of people. I've never met a single human being who thinks there is any purpose served by forcing state legal cannabis business to be conducted on an all-cash basis. Nobody, not a single person. If you care about tax evasion, money laundering, theft, let them have bank accounts. <laughs> and if you want the industry to grow and thrive, allow them the same cash management techniques that every other state legal business have. The other outrage is that we have this 280E provision that denies state legal enterprises to be unable to deduct all their business expenses from their taxes. 
It results, as you know, in taxing levels that are two, three, five times higher than other, they're, they're, it's confiscatory. And again, it's an artificial and unfair constraint on allowing these businesses to thrive. We don't need the major reform legislation like Senator Wyden and I introduced a couple weeks ago that sort of hits all the highlights. All we need to do is be able to, in one of the tax bills that's going through, repeal 280E and be able to deal meaningfully with the financial regulations to allow access to bank accounts. As I, when I introduced the 280E legislation for the first time three years ago, I was joined by Grover Norquist, <laughs> the anti-tax Republican conservative activist. Grover admits that this is nuts, and it shows the breadth of support for what we want to do. And I have had conversations really at a very high level with the Trump administration, or somebody you've seen on television and heard, who thinks that it is appalling that it's conducted on an all-cash basis, and he didn't know that they couldn't deduct their business expenses, <laughs> and felt that this is something that this administration ought to be able to do. I agree. And we will be looking, building the bipartisan support, looking for whatever vehicle that's going forward. And I'm confident that sooner rather than later, that the industry will be able to pay fair taxes with a check. And we shouldn't quit until that happens. Now, one of the reasons I'm excited about that is because of what the industry is doing. And I would just like to give a shout out to those of you who've helped lead this national effort. The people who are working here in the cannabis industry in Oregon have, have been striving to be the gold standard. You've been in Washington, D.C., you've been in Salem, you've been in City Hall, making the case, treat us like other businesses, let us work, demonstrate what is possible, have government get out of the way at least, don't interfere. You have made your case point by point by point. You're showing the face of the modern cannabis industry, articulate, grown up, forceful, and it's making a difference. You are in the process of lobbying with increasing sophistication. You've got organizations that compete with the other uh, lobbyists and interest groups in Washington, D.C. Uh, you are learning to reward your friends and punish your enemies and speak out when you're cranky. <laughs> and you're doing so in a way that is thoughtful, sophisticated, and relentless. And I commend you for that. You made my job easier. And working with you, frankly, is a lot of fun. There's great energy, there's commitment, there's passion, there are powerful stories of what you've been able to do to help your customers and the community. Keep it up. Because we're on the threshold. I think that we have an excellent chance of taking care of these three problems, research, taxation, and banking, in this Congress. I think we are in a position to reposition, scale down, and eliminate some of the most egregious aspects of the war on drugs. And we're starting to see a shift. Isn't it exciting what's being considered in Canada? It's going to be the second country that has, on a national basis, legalized cannabis. I think it's exciting that Canada, that Mexico, is reconsidering its long-held position, realizing what damage has been done to that country by treating marijuana as an illegal commodity. 
it is fascinating to think of what we could have here in the West in terms of a market from British Columbia down to Mexico. Things are happening in a way that I could not be more excited. But I hope that everybody who cares about cannabis, health, the economy, criminal justice, and science will take up this cause with the same fervor that the prohibitionists had a century ago with alcohol. They were never actually the majority of people in this country, but they were effective, single-minded, active politically, badgering politicians, great at beating the drum, mobilizing people, and they were able to institute a 12-year disastrous prohibition of alcohol. Well, I don't want you to be misguided like those people, but I would like you to have that same fervor because we're on the cusp of turning this around. With your help, with your energy, with your focus, we will do so, and America will be the better. Thank you very much. Thank you.